I just want to teach a little bit about the kingdom of heaven and I just want to elaborate a little bit on this healing thing and how we can walk in it. <clears throat> if you guys are cool with that. So I'm I'm really st like I said I'm really stoked that this revelation is starting to really hit the church now of what we all have an access to, you know, cuz for so long it's been like you know, it's only the apostles and prophets and main leaders that can walk in these things. But like I said, Mark chapter 16, it says, to those who believe they will lay hands on the sick and they will see people healed. It, is, it doesn't say to those who are apostles or to those who are prophets. It's to those who believe. You know, the move of God that's taking place globally right now, it, it has nothing to do with a great apostle or prophet stepping into their calling. Like it has everything to do with all the saints waking up and recognizing who they are. You know, you look even in in the church of acts like what they had an access to like you look at acts chapter six like it wasn't just the apostles and prophets who were healing the sick it, it talks about those who were like waiting tables they moved in signs and wonders you know it wasn't it wasn't just the higher ups it was every single person in the body of christ they were doing the stuff it did not matter who they were you know so i'm going to share uh i'm going to share again a little bit from luke chapter 11 verse 2 kind of like i did in question and answer so luke chapter 11 verse 2 Jesus' disciples, they come to him and they ask Jesus how they should pray. And the reason why I believe they came to Jesus is because, you know, they saw the Sadducees pray and they saw the Pharisees pray, but they understood that when Jesus prayed, something actually happened and something shifted. You know, there was a special authority on his words. So they said, Jesus, can you teach us how to pray? So Jesus says, Kate, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that's really what I want to focus on with you guys right now is this whole concept of, you know, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus was actually telling his disciples, you guys, when you pray, pray that whatever is happening in the culture of heaven, in the kingdom of heaven, that it would actually be established here on the earth. You know, it was like it was like colonization when Rome actually coveted a new territory way back in the time. What they would do is they would actually send out colonies and their job was to like, you know, find a territory, find a place to take over it and to make those places look like Rome. You know, so they would make the architecture like Rome. They would make uh, the currency like Rome and the economy like Rome, the money like Rome. And eventually what happened is they had a bunch of Romes beyond Rome. Like it was colonization, and that's what Jesus came to do. Jesus came from heaven to earth, and his job was to make earth look like heaven. You know, so what does the Bible say about heaven? It says that there's no sickness, there's no disease, there's no depression, there's no anxiety, there, there's no poverty. You know, and Jesus' heart was that this perfect culture of heaven would actually be established here on the earth in every single individual's life. A lot of us here in the church, like what we believe is that you need to push through this really tough life. We need to push through sickness and disease. We need to push through depression and anxiety and insecurities. And then eventually we get the gift of death. And then we get to experience paradise. Then we get to experience heaven. When Jesus actually taught something extremely different. Jesus was like, you know what, you don't need to wait until you die to experience this stuff. You can experience it here and now because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You know, it's interesting to me that Jesus didn't say, you know, the kingdom of heaven is, is in arm's reach. Like, you don't even need to reach up and grab it. The kingdom of heaven is already yours through the cross. It is at your hand, and all that you need to do is just learn how to close your hand and claim what's yours. You know, this, this can actually be our reality. So, like, what does it look like when heaven invades earth? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share some testimonies with you guys. I was, um, what one do I want to share? So many testimonies. <laughs> um, I'll share Aston. I didn't talk about Aston here, hey? So when I was, uh, a few months ago, I was speaking down in Saskatchewan. And um, I was speaking at a youth conference. There was about 300 youth there. And it was amazing how hungry these youth were. A lot of them were more conservative, so they didn't hear about the things like moving of the spirit. But when they started hearing about it, they got hungry for it. Like, there were times when I was speaking where like at least a hundred of the youth they were so hungry that they wouldn't even sit in their pews they would literally just sit at my feet at the altar while i taught like they were just so 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 hungry and one of those nights i was uh i was prepping to go and speak and as i was praying i was kind of like prepping my message and god only gave me three testimonies to share and i was like that's it i'm like i'm gonna 
get through these testimonies in like five minutes sort of thing. I'm like, do you have anything else? And God said, no. He said, tonight I'm going to be wild. That's all he said to me. He said, tonight I'm going to be wild. I'm like, well, you better be wild because I only have three testimonies. So I'm going to be standing up there with nothing to say if you don't show up. So I started speaking and I started just releasing testimonies. And man, like heaven, heaven on earth happened. It was like, whatever you prayed for in this place, like God just showed up, you know, like God just moved in power. And it was like, we were seeing so many, so many people healed. We saw at least 80 notable miracles that night. And we were seeing such crazy stuff. Like we were, there was a girl there, all of her fingers were shorter on one hand by about an inch compared to her other hand. And we prayed for her and watched every single one of her fingers grow up and meet with her other hand. There was a there was a blind girl that was there. She was uh, blind in one eye since birth. And she came up to the front in front of everyone. Because we had like, like Jesus was showing up in such, such power and such miracles. Like people weren't even in their pews. Like we had a little circle up at the front and there were like 200 youth just piled around us just watching miracles happen. One kid was actually so hungry to see the things of God that he actually tried to climb this 15 foot wall of speakers and he was trying to climb up them so that he could watch the miracles taking place. And then one of the youth leaders grabbed him and pulled him off. Thank, thank God, because that would have been bad. But so this girl comes up to the front, and she's blind in one eye. And she's like, can Jesus heal my eye? I haven't seen through this eye since I was born. So I was like, well, you know what? I've, I've seen a lot of blind eyes open, so let's get someone else praying for you. And I grabbed this little nine-year-old girl and pulled her up to the front. And I was like, I'm going to get you to pray for her, and Jesus is going to heal her through your hands. So this little girl lays her hands on her and just starts praying this really simple prayer. And all of a sudden, this, this girl's eye just opens up and she sees faces for the first time in her entire life through that eye. It's just so amazing the things we were seeing. There was, um, there was one girl there who had a crushed spine. She got in a car accident. The doctor said she would never grow in height again. You know, and we sat her down on the chair in front of everyone and prayed for one of her legs to grow out and it grew past the other. So I was like, God's going to make you taller. We prayed for her other leg, and it grew out and met up with her other foot. I think probably the coolest miracle that happened there was there was a, there was a girl who was born with an extra rib on one side of a rib cage and minus a rib on the other side. And we prayed for her. And after we prayed for her, we got her to touch her ribs to test it out. And when she did that, one of her ribs jumped to the other side of her rib cage. And Jesus just reconstructed her rib cage. Isn't that so cool? That just pumps me up. But that's what it looks like when heaven invades earth, you guys. Like, you know, the Bible talks about two kingdoms. It talks about the kingdom of heaven, which is the kingdom of God. And it talks about the kingdom of darkness. So when the kingdom of God shows up, you don't, when two kingdoms collide, the greater kingdom will always prevail. You know, so all these people had all these things wrong with their body. They were experiencing aspects of the kingdom of darkness. And when the kingdom of heaven showed up, it, it just, the kingdom of darkness had to leave. You know, the kingdom of God was established. The culture of heaven that we talked about was actually made manifest. I, I feel like, I feel to kind of share this with you guys just because you're all leaders and I really feel like some of you guys are really going to be kind of orchestrating um, healing meetings and all that sorts of stuff. And uh, I wasn't going to share on this, but I, I will. God's been teaching me a lot on how to build atmospheres as I'm teaching. And this is what I did on this night at Aston, because when I first walked into the room, like there was, there was no anointing really. Like sometimes you step into a meeting and like there's already a wave happening that God's doing and you can just jump on the wave and God will start moving. Sometimes you walk into a meeting and God wants to move, but there's no, there's no momentum at all. So as people of faith, we can actually learn how to move in authority to actually create waves for God to move. So what I did when I came into this meeting, like... If right when I started speaking, we prayed for that girl with the ribs, like she, she probably wouldn't have gotten healed because there was no faith in the room. So what, I, what I've started to learn how to do in building atmospheres is like, if I go into a meeting like this, I'll start building their faith. And how I'll start is I'll start sharing testimonies of just different things that I've seen God do. And as you share testimonies, people's, people's faith will start rising up a little bit. And then I'll start praying for some of the smaller miracles. I'll be like, okay, now I'm going to activate you guys on how to move in faith as well. So if you have back problems or if you have a headache, stand up in the room right now. Like this, this is small stuff. This isn't lifting people out of wheelchairs yet. This isn't blind eyes getting healed yet. 
So I'll be like, okay, back problems and headaches, you guys stand up right now. And then since I, I built their, their faith up a little bit through testimonies, they have the faith to see backs healed and they have the faith to see headaches healed. So they'll pray for those, those people will start getting healed and then their faith is a little bit higher. So then what I did is I brought people up who one of their legs was shorter than their other legs and we watched legs grow out in Jesus' name. And after that happened, the faith was high enough for creative miracles to start happening. And then this is where we started seeing all the really wild stuff. You know, we started praying for girls who were depressed, who cut themselves, and we'd pray for the scars and watch them disappear. Like, we saw, like, so many miracles, you guys. But it's all because I, I had a revelation on how to actually build atmosphere in the room and to build faith within the room. And I'm sharing that with you guys again because I feel like there's some, some of you guys here, you're, you're really called to do these sorts of things and to lead these sorts of meetings. And so I just wanted to kind of give that to you as a tool. Um, so with all this heaven on earth sorts of stuff, Jesus brought this to the next level. And this is where it gets really exciting because like, yeah, our job is to contend for heaven to come to earth. But we need to understand that the kingdom of heaven is inside of us. You know, this perfect culture of heaven that I'm talking about, where there is no sickness, there is no disease, there is no depression, there's none of this stuff. Like, we need to understand, you guys, that this is actually our internal reality constantly. You know, Jesus said in Luke chapter um, 17, verse 21, he, this is me paraphrasing, but Jesus said, you guys are really good observers of the kingdom. You know, you see the kingdom over here and over there to your right and to your left, but assuredly, I say to you, the kingdom of heaven is inside of you. And this is where a lot of the church is at today, unfortunately. Like, we're good observers of the kingdom, but we're not good doers of the kingdom because we're, we're just observing and we're like, well, God is moving up at Bethel. The kingdom's being poured out there. Revival is happening there. Signs and wonders are happening there. We look at Kansas City with IHOP. God is moving there. Toronto Airport Church, God's definitely moving there. You know, but I feel like Jesus is saying to the global church right now, assuredly, I say to you, the kingdom of heaven is inside of you. You're good observers, but you need to understand the kingdom of heaven is within you. Revival is actually inside of you, you know? So everywhere that we go, you guys, because of what we carry, we don't even realize it, but atmospheres are shifting and changing because of the power of the cross and, and the power of the kingdom of heaven that abides inside of us. And the more that we begin to realize this, that we're powerful people, not in and of ourselves, but through the cross in Christ, we are powerful people. And we can actually bring, we can bring change not only to individuals' lives, not only will we lay hands on the sick and see people healed, but we can see entire communities transformed through the power of the cross, entire cities, entire regions, entire nations being transformed. And it's all through this revelation of understanding how powerful Christ is in us, you know? Because for years and years and years, how we've done revival is like, we'll sit and we'll, we'll talk to God and we'll pray to God and we'll be like, God, we pray that you pour out your fire. We pray that you'll pour out revival. And then what we do is we sit and we wait for God to do something. When really God is raising up the church right now to pray and intercede and say, God, pour out revival. But then by faith, we don't just sit and wait for it to happen. We step out and we start doing revival. And this is where the shift needs to happen. And once we do this, I believe that we're going to start seeing transformation, tra transformation in nations. <laughs> yeah, transformation. <laughs> It's going to happen, though. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to happen, though. God's been speaking to me a lot about uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 26 and 27. And it says, uh, it says, To he who overcomes and does my works until the end, I will give him an iron scepter to rule over the nations with me. And how many of you guys know that, like, Revelation 12, it says, to, it says you know, we overcame in Christ. Jesus overcame, you know, so we're the overcomers. So we're given an iron scepter to rule and reign with Christ over the nations. And if you translate this word iron scepter from uh, the Greek and the Hebrew, it actually translates back to the same word that was used for uh, Moses' rod, actually. So it's really, it's really interesting what Moses did with the authority that he, that he had with his rod. Like, yes, he performed signs and wonders before Pharaoh, but more importantly, he actually used his authority to deliver an entire nation out of bondage into freedom. You know, and this is, the, this is the power and the authority that God is releasing over the church today. Like, a lot of the church is having troubles believing that we can pray for the sick to see people healed. But God is actually calling the church right now to believe that we can see entire nations healed and saved. Like, this, this is where we got to be. 
And like Jody, you were telling me the story about like the mountain lifting up and a nation being changed through that, through that sign and a wonder. And I think of that and it's like, man, sometimes I still have troubles believing to see a headache healed, you know, but God is actually calling us as the church. He's like, he's like, come on, like we got to get our faith up because we got to start believing that we're so powerful in Christ that we can see nations transformed into the likeness of heaven. (laughs) <laughs> and it all, man, oh, I'm, I'm getting really passionate and excited, you guys. It, it's all through this revelation of how important we are in God's kingdom, that we're called to co-labor with him in power and in love for the gospel. You know, I remember a while back, I was, um, I was sitting in Tim Hortons, sitting in this coffee shop, and as I'm sitting there, I look across from me, and there's this man on the other side of the Tim Hortons, the other side of the coffee shop and he's just staring at me he's about 45 years old and i'm i'm kind of looking at him because i'm studying and you know an hour passes by and this guy is still watching me like he's just he's just looking at me and he wasn't even awkward about it like i would look up at him and i would like give him a head nod to to be like hey you know i know you're looking at me it's a little weird so maybe stop and he would just look at me back and he would just give me a head nod head nod back and smile and just keep watching me i'm like this is terrible so it lasts for about an hour. Next day, I come back to this came, same coffee shop, and he's there again. He does the same thing again for an hour straight, just watches me. I come back again the next day. He's watching me for another hour. So I didn't go back to that Tim Hortons for about a month. I was like, I'm not going back there because that weird guy is there. But uh, so a month goes by, and I'm, uh, I was like, all right, well, I'm going to go back there again, I guess. And so I'm about to leave to go to this coffee shop, and God gives me a vision of this guy. And then God speaks to me and says, he's going to be there and he's going to watch you again. But he says, you need to understand that when he looks at you, he, he feels the presence of God and he feels the kingdom of heaven inside of you. So this time you need to talk to him. So I go to the Tim Hortons, I go to the coffee shop and I sit down and the guy is still there, watches me for another hour. And when he gets up and he goes to leave, through the, to leave the coffee shop, I stop him and I say, hey, do you have five minutes? And he's like, yeah, I do. And I'm like, sit down. And he sits down with me. And I said to him, I was like, look, you feel drawn to me. I know that you feel drawn to me. And I was like, do you know why you feel drawn to me? He's like, I have no clue. And he's like, when I look at you, I just see life and I see fire in you. And I was like, well, the reason why you feel drawn to me is because I'm a Christian. And when you look at me, you feel the presence of God, can't you? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, right now you can feel the presence of God, can't you? And he's like, yeah. And he starts crying. And I got to lead him to, lead him to Jesus right there. You know, but it's just such a good example of like, you know, because of a revelation of what I carried, because of a revelation of the power that I have abiding inside of me, because greater in me is greater than he who is in the world. You know, someone, someone's life got transformed. And, you know, like whenever Jesus would go and pray for someone, whenever he would go out and heal the sick, he does things so differently than we do. Like, a lot of people in the church, when we go to pray for someone to see people healed, like, we're like, oh, Father, I pray that if it's your will that this person will be healed, and only if it's your will, though. You know, Jesus wasn't like that. When Jesus would walk up to someone to pray for them to see someone healed, Jesus wouldn't talk up to the Father that the Father would reach down and do something about it. Jesus had a revelation of what he carried. So that when Jesus walked up to someone, all that he did was he just stretched out his hand and he performed the miracle. It was a revelation of co-laboring. It wasn't a revelation of him asking someone else to do it for him. It was like, you know, God the Father has already given me the authority. The, the kingdom of heaven abides in me. And because I'm powerful, I can stretch out my hands and I can do this stuff. You know, we can all do this, you guys. And this is why I want to get you guys activated so much in like words of knowledge, gifts of healing, all this prophetic stuff. Because... I don't know. Preaching the gospel is awesome. I know, that we're, I know that we're all trained to preach the gospel, but man, when we can have an aspect of power to our ministry, like, man, God is just going to move. God is just going to move, and I want you guys to feel safe enough to, to be able to step out in the marketplace and in the malls and not be worried about making mistakes because, you know, even when you make mistakes stepping out, God will still use it, and he'll still move. Like, I was sharing at the last church that I was with, like, I've given wrong words of knowledge on the streets, and I've seen people ha- saved by them. Like, it's just true. I remember a long time ago, I was, uh, I was working at Starbucks. I was a barista. I don't look like I would be a barista. I'm, I used to be a construction worker, but... So I used to be a barista, and um, 
on my breaks, like this, this Starbucks was actually right by the hospital. So on my breaks, I would, uh, I would actually go and I would pray for the sick in the hospital on my breaks and then I'd come back and work. But I remember this one day I was going over to the hospital and I, uh, while I was walking there, I saw a guy at the hospital and he was wearing, he was in a wheelchair. He had casts on both of his legs and he was kind of like a punk rocker. So he had a big mohawk dyed red. And as I'm walking up to him, I asked, Holy Spirit, I was like, can I get a word of knowledge from you for this guy? And the word, the name Bradley pops into my head. So I was like, okay, sounds like a good word of knowledge. I'll, I'll go talk to this guy. So I walk up to this guy and I'm like, hey, is your name Bradley? He's like, no. I'm like, is your name, or do you have a, is your dad's name Bradley or your uncle? He's like, no. Is anyone in your family, is their name Bradley? No. Do you have any friends named Bradley? No. Have you ever met anyone in your life named Bradley? No. <laughs> So I'm like, I, in my mind, I'm like, well, at least he's talking to me. Like, my word of knowledge failed epically, but at least he's talking to me. So I said to him, I'm like, you know what, like, what happened to your legs? And he's like, well, two days ago, I, I was drunk, and I, I jumped off a balcony, and I shattered both of my heels. So I don't have heels anymore. So I'm like, oh, well, if you let me pray for you right now, I'm a Christian. God will heal your, God will heal your heels. So he's like, sure, go for it. So I said to his friend, I'm like, dude, I don't even know what you believe, but lay hands on your friend right now and pray with me because God's going to heal him. So this guy lay, lays hands on him, and we start praying for this guy, and no word of a lie, God just gave him new, new heels. Like, he had no heels, and all, in a split second, he had heels. Like, and he got saved because of this. Like, isn't that amazing? All through a wrong word of knowledge. You know, all because I came to this revelation, you know, like I'm just this young punk kid, but you know, God wants to use me. So I'm going to step out in faith. And even if I make a mistake, because God is good, he's still going to use that. You know, so I want you guys to feel empowered enough where it's like, you know what, I'm going to step out, out I'm going to start walking in these things. And even if, even if I make a mistake, even if I try and prophesy and it's a wrong word, like God will still use it because God is good and he'll use me in my weakness. All that he's waiting for is he's waiting for us to just understand that he wants to partner with us. You know, we're, sometimes we slip into this works mentality really easily where it's like, you know what, I'm not good enough to be used by God or, you know, God might use this big evangelist to lay hands on the sick to see people healed. But you know what, like we got to get out of that mindset and we got to start understanding that we're important. Like, like you're important and you are significant. We got to get comfortable with that. I remember this other time, this is the last testimony that I'll share and then I'll, I'll close up and we'll pray, but this is probably one of my favorite testimonies. We've seen a lot of stuff, but you always have your favorite testimonies and this is one of my favorite testimonies of what we've seen so far. I was um, one day taking out a group of people and I was training them on how to lay hands on the sick to see people healed and we were at the same hospital actually and I see this woman sitting in a wheelchair and she had a cast on her leg. So we walk up to her and I was like, hey, this might be weird to you. I'm a Christian. Can I pray for you? I believe that God wants to heal your leg. And then I, she's like, sure. And I'm like, what happened to you? And she was really open with us to share with us. She's like, well, you know what? My, my boyfriend is really abusive. And a few nights ago, he was drunk and he actually, we got in an argument and he threw me down the stairs and I broke my leg in two different places. So I was like, okay, well, we're going to pray for you. We pray for her. And after I prayed for her, I got her to test it out. And as I got her to test it out, she steps down on the ground, and right when she did that, her bones fused back together right on the spot. So we kept talking with this woman, and uh, she started telling us that she was actually in a prostitution lifestyle, and she was a, like a practicing prostitute, and she was trying to get out of it. So we were just talking with her, praying with her, loving on her, and we told her that, uh, that in a few days we would come back and we would just kind of love on her. So two days later, we come back to the hospital and we brought her flowers and all this stuff because we wanted her to feel special. And when we saw her there, she's sitting on the bench and she looks like so excited that she's like just going to jump out of her skin. So I, I walk up to her and I'm like, why are you so excited? What's up? And she was like, well, about a year ago, I took a test for, uh, to see if I had any sexually transmitted diseases, and I had nine. And the doctor said I would have these for the rest of my life. But after you guys prayed for me, I went in for another test, and I just got my results back, and I'm completely healed of all my STDs. 
And she said, not only that, but because of my lifestyle and prostitution, a bunch of my family, my, my close family, they all broke relationship with me and I haven't talked to any of them for about 15 years. And after you guys prayed for me, I got three phone calls from my family, all of them saying that they want to be in relationship with me again. You know, and that's just, it's so moving to me because like, all that happened was the kingdom of heaven came into her life. She was, she was plagued by the kingdom of darkness, you guys. But when the kingdom came in, it casted out the darkness. And all of these things in her life just came into alignment. You know, and all that it took was like one, one person or one group to step out of their comfort zones for like three minutes. And all of a sudden, this woman's life is completely transformed and it will never be the same again. So this woman, she's so stoked. So she's like, if Jesus can do this for me, can, can he do it for my friend? And we're like, absolutely. So she runs into the hospital and wheels out her friend. So her friend that she brought to us was in a wheelchair. She had, this woman had just like everything wrong with her physically. Like she had a big, she was a Caucasian woman, but she had a big rash going up her leg and it was like a dark, 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 dark red. She, uh, her ankle was completely destroyed and it was actually being held together by a screw, like by a piece of metal. Her shoulder, she said, was in so much pain that for about 18 and a half years, like it hurt so bad that if you were to touch it, she would rather be giving childbirth. It hurt that bad. And her hand was in the shape of a claw due to arthritis and she had a big lump sticking out of her back the size of an egg. So she's like, can Jesus heal me? And I was like, I believe he can. So... I lay my hand on this woman's head and I start to pray. Instantly, she just starts weeping. And I spoke to her, the, her skin color, like, again, just coming to a revelation of what I carried, who I was. And I spoke to her skin color and I said, in Jesus' name, I declare that this red will just go back to a pale white. And right when I said that, her skin color just went from a dark red to a pale white. And she's like freaking out. She's like, wow, that's incredible. And I was like, well, Jesus doesn't just want to heal your rash. He wants to heal the rest of your body as well. So I grabbed her by the hands and I lifted her up and I started walking with her. And when I did, her, her, her ankle was completely healed to the point where the metal that was in her ankle completely melted. Like it wasn't even there anymore. So I'm walking with this woman. She starts weeping all over again. And she says, for the first time in 18 and a half years, my shoulder doesn't hurt anymore. And like this woman is just getting, her, her body is just getting transformed. And I looked over to my friend who, uh, whose leg got healed the day before and she had about like five cigarettes already because she was so freaked out by what God was doing to this woman right before her eyes. But this, uh, so this woman after her shoulder gets healed, she gets so excited that she throws her hands up in the air and she runs over to my other friend and gives him a hug. And when she does this, her hand that was in the shape of a claw completely stretched out. And then she said, sit me back down. I want you to run your hand across my back and see if the lump is gone. And then we did that and the lump completely disintegrated off of her back. You know, like, isn't that powerful? And that didn't happen within the four walls, walls of the church. Like that happened out in the marketplace. You know, we need to understand you guys that this is, this stuff is for all of us. This stuff didn't die out in the church of Acts. It didn't, otherwise there wouldn't be chapters like 1 Corinthians 14 or 1 Corinthians 12 that talked about the gifts of the Spirit. That, that, that's not there just for us to understand history. That's, that's there for us so that we can actually apply these things to our lives. You know, this isn't for the extremely spiritual mature. This is for anyone who is in Christ. You know, a lot of people think that these things are like, you know, only the very, very, very mature Christians will do these things. Really, it's for all of us. You know, you look at Luke chapter 10. Jesus commissions his disciples and says, you guys go out and heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons freely as you've received, freely give. And they go out and they do all these great things of the kingdom, all these things that we look at them and we say, oh, well, that's what the mature Christians do. And then in Luke chapter 11, they come back the very next chapter and they say to Jesus, like, well, we've done all these things now. We've, saw all, we've seen all this stuff. We've seen demons flee. We've seen the sick healed. We've seen the dead raised. And then they say to Jesus, can you teach us how to pray now? See, like, the disciples were doing all these crazy things that we see, we think only mature Christians do, but they didn't even know how to pray yet. And, like, I look at everyone in this room, I can guarantee you that every one of you knows how to pray. And if you know how to pray, then you're more qualified than the disciples were to do all these things that they did. <laughs> so good.